As a startup scales, the need for funding becomes more important. The challenge is to find the right balance between growth and profitability. Too much growth can often lead to cash flow problems. Too much profitability can lead to a loss of focus on the customer. Yet another challenge of scaling startup culture is, of course, retaining your top talent. As you grow, you'll inevitably lose some of your best employees to other companies. How do you navigate this complex environment of competing needs and challenges in order to grow predictably? I'm hoping our guest, who has over a decade of VC experience, will be able to provide some answers. Hello, and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast, brought to you by SprattWorth.com. I'm Renee Koshi, and our guest today is Anupam Rostogi. Uh, Anupam, you are general partner at Emergent Ventures, and you've turned really your, your startup building passion into a venture capital career. You've played a key role in something like 20 plus successful global technology investments. I believe you focus on seed and early stage investments in the enterprise AI startup space, particularly in the areas of workflow automation, future work, vertical SaaS, developer tools, and AI cloud infrastructure. <clears throat> You've uh, been investing in enterprise AI for something like 12 plus years. Uh, closely working up with uh, startups in AI and cloud infrastructure. Prior to Emergent, however, you founded NX Partners to help uh, high potential SaaS companies accelerate their growth rates and outcomes. Uh, and you've worked closely with a half dozen startups across the enterprise uh, landscape. You've actually held investing roles of increasing uh, responsibility at NGP Capital, a global venture firm with uh, over 1.6 billion uh, in assets under management, uh, where you led the intelligent enterprise investing team, identifying and investing in companies at the intersection of data, internet of things, and machine intelligence. Just to give people um, a bit of an idea, you've originated, led, managed, or supported uh, investments, including Deliveroo, Rocket Fuel, Get Your Guide, Shadow Facts, just to name a few. You've obviously had uh, quite a bit of experience, including bringing to market four new products, setting up uh, a big data analytics stack in Fortune 100 uh, environments. I'm curious, with the with starting Emergent Ventures, was there a specific problem that you were trying to solve and has that changed uh, over time? Yeah, happy to answer that. First of all, thanks a lot uh, for having me and it's a pleasure to join you. Uh, yeah, in terms of Emergent, our the reason we started or the gaps we were seeing and the thesis that we are focused on has been really around AI and data powered SaaS and the infrastructure uh, that mm -hmm. supports all of that. Uh, we come in fairly early at the pre-seed and seed stages, typically leading or co-leading the seed rounds. And our focus has been helping founders, really supporting them in the first few years, getting these companies off the ground, getting the product market fit, building out scalable go-to-market early on, and then navigating future milestones, such as future fundraising and eventually exits and things of that nature. So we were seeing the thesis was really around building a firm, which can be a close partner to founders early on in the SaaS space, and within that on the AI-powered SaaS space, and helping them navigate a lot of these early parts. And some of that is born from my prior experiences working with a number of startups that there's quite a few things which are very specific to the domain and to the company and founders are by far best in charge of that. They know that best. But there's a certain set of things which are very horizontal where you can take a leaf out of uh, the book of a lot of other companies that have been there, done that and built those things. So a lot of things around scale, uh, scaling these startups, building out go-to-market, uh, iterating on PMF. Of course, the podcast is focused on predictability. So a lot of things around that. There's a lot of science to it in, a, in addition to the art, which is horizontal. And that's what we try and bring to uh, the companies that we work with is that view uh, horizontally mm -hmm. from what's working, what's not, what's likely to work. So that was part of our founding thesis. And now we have about 40 companies that we are investors in across different stages, ranging from seed to early to growth stages. And that's what we do. Certainly. I'm curious, when did Emergent Ventures, when was it founded? In 2016, about seven years back. One would think that perhaps founders would have more resources and perhaps get better at this whole idea of 
and product market fit, creating go-to-market strategy, etc. What, in your opinion uh, or perspective, would you say is something that trips founders and entrepreneurs as they try to get to the, the next level up? There is a very wide set of things that you need to get right, uh, at least mm-hmm. many of them right at the right time. There's many things that can go wrong over a period of time. Of course, at the stage we come in at, the first initial thing is really getting to that early product market fit, really building a product that customers want, to say it in a very basic mm-hmm. manner. But that has obviously a lot of nuance to it. Right. right product with the right features, right price point, right positioning, going to the right champion, right persona of the right size company and saying the right things to them and then getting right sized uh, deals uh, to get going. So getting that early product market fit, I'd say that's often a journey, takes a lot of iteration and taking market feedback, taking all the inputs from what you hear, hearing from customers and be able to iterate on that really fast and with the right judgment. And there's a lot of art and science to it. Mm. I'd say that's the first piece. But I think you also alluded to the scaling or growing piece. And there's quite a few things there. As the startup grows, let's say you've done the initial zero to one journey. You've found your, let's say you're selling to enterprise. You've found the first five, 10 enterprise customers, mostly through founder-led selling. You have good deal sizes. Maybe you have a million ARR or something in that vicinity. And as you start to scale in the early days, a lot of things have to evolve very fast. So what works for you now may not work in six months. What is working six months back may not work now and so on. And you have to keep increasing the aperture of your effort continuously. And specifically, if you take sales and marketing to keep growing at the same rate, you have to continuously grow your sales and marketing, both teams and effort and the footprint of that. So you have to grow the number of leads, the number of engagements that you have at the top of the funnel and you have to grow your sales team. So you're ramped up reps at a pace that's aligned with how fast you're growing your marketing team, but also at a pace that's aligned with how fast your market can take your product. And that takes a lot of uh, you know uh, thinking. And I'd say that's one part we often see once uh, founders get that early PMF. It's really important to put more behind that if you feel that there is that early PMF and you're starting to see some level of more customers mm-hmm. are buying it, the same product without many changes. At that point, you want to really start building out institutionalized sales and marketing processes and team at an early level initially. By institutionalized, I certainly don't mean you should go and hire 10 marketeers uh, to start mm-hmm. with, but you need to really put those processes in place and continuously every quarter, you have to be growing the aperture if you're seeing it work. Otherwise, what happens is both sales and marketing have a six to nine month lag from the time of your input to make right. it specific. Let's say you want to hire an AE. You decide today you want uh, an AE added to the team. Typically, it takes nine months if it's an enterprise type sale from the time you decided to have someone really hitting quota because you know it will take a couple of months to really hire them, get them started, and then six months to four to six months to fully ramp up. Similarly, in marketing, if you want to hit a certain target three quarters from now, you need to plan the marketing for it now because depending on your sales cycles, you need to f- start filling up that funnel. And speaking of funnels, it goes going back to your question of what can what changes. What we've seen and it happens for almost every company is your mix of channels that work changes pretty dramatically. So when you are at zero ARR, you're getting your first few customers that can often be hand combat really through the founders, through introductions or through just whatever they can do. They will find 20 leads and maybe close three to five customers. But then as you start to get to, you want to close a few hundred thousand per quarter, then you get to a million dollar quarter, the mix of leads may change and the channels that were working for you at a certain scale may not work for, if they were working for you to generate 10 leads a month, they may not work at 50 leads a month, you need to add other channels. So finding those scalable channels becomes important and you have to do that six to nine months in advance of the goals you're trying to hit. So I'd say that's often something we see with many companies that they learn that the hard way that when things are working, when things are not working, you obviously need to be cognizant and not invest too much behind that. So we see that as well, that sometimes founders or you know, teams will just, they want to grow and they think that things are working and they'll put a lot of capital behind it and then they have to retract. And in other cases, things are working and they are just, uh, they don't realize how much uh, of hiring and investing they have to do now to drive that goal for three quarters from now. 
Let me pause there and see. If, if I can put this another way, it would, not only are you bringing your experience, the investments that you have and, and prior experience as well, but you're almost helping them look into the future to address potential bumps in the road. It's certainly bringing in systems as well and really being an advisor to, to their journey. Would that be a fair way of putting it? Yeah, that's the role we... Seek to Certainly. I'm also curious, given your journey to date, which has obviously been quite extensive, what would you say would be your personal area of strength? Yeah, that's why I really enjoy working closely with founders and being that first call mm-hmm. whenever they are, they have any uh, thing they want to brainstorm and decide on, and it can be something really strategic, very big picture. Should they raise a financing round? Should they entertain an M&A offer? Or it could be really small and sound trivial. But I enjoy that. And I'm always on calls, text, WhatsApp, email with founders and just being a sounding board to mm-hmm. them. On, And I think, like I was saying, enjoy that process of bringing that horizontal sense of across the sure. B2B SaaS landscape with both the zero to one and one to N journeys. And uh, while fully understanding and giving full credit that founders are literally doing 100% and more of everything. So all the success is theirs and it's driven by them and they're the closest to the business. But whatever little we can do to change that trajectory or spark some ideas or help them think through a certain situation, that's what uh, excites me. And in that area of strength, what would you say is something that businesses don't know but should? What do businesses not know? In that Uh, area of strength. Yeah, I'd say... uh, what I was alluding to earlier, I'd say founders these days, especially the startups we're working with, generally extremely smart and there's a lot of information out there on blogs and podcasts and other things. So people generally know things, but it's really about what to do in which situation. That's the part that often takes some iteration and bouncing and getting the right advice. That's where I think the right advice and right frameworks can often help and the right reference mm-hmm. points. And then, but still, I think in many cases, there's no right answer. So really you have to go with your gut and your judgment and make that call. <laughs> Interesting. I'd love to dive into that in a, in a bit. But when you're looking to make these investments, so are there particular criteria or key criteria that you're looking for when considering these pre-seed or seed stage investments? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of things. In a real nutshell, we are looking for companies that can be category defining large outcomes. So primarily we want to be involved in supporting companies that can eventually be a big needle moving category leading outcome. Of course, at the stage we are investing at, a small percentage of companies will get there, but we are really looking for, and at that stage, it's really about theme and market. There's not really a lot of data points and there may be some data points, some customers in some cases, but it's not really meaningful. So it's really about the founding team which we spend a lot of time with getting comfortable and with overall market, are you in the right zip code? Is this an attractive general market? But what that maps into specifically is really, I'd say vision, ambition, ability, and then path to that large outcome. And that's where we are spending time in the few weeks that we spend with founders before we mutually decide to work together is seeing that if there is that vision, ambition, ability, and then some credible paths. Obviously, many things have to get go right, but is there a credible path of how this company gets to be, let's say, a couple of hundred million ARR in seven, eight years from now? And then we are then literally many things that we are looking at below that, of course, how's the competition? How's the market structure? What pricing can you drive? How many customers are there? Is there a credible go-to-market you can build? How are your thoughts? All of that. And then on the team side, I'd say, again, that's the piece or area we spend the most time on. It's really a people business mm-hmm. at the stage we are coming in at, especially. And so this is a ton of many different things we are trying to just assess and founders are trying to assess. We are the right investors for them. But we're trying to really see, see folks who are, of course, smart, they have big ambition and vision and that we are aligned with. And we see the world the same way. But also, really, are they fundamentally very ethical, very honest, both with themselves and us. And are they great learners? Can they iterate? Because the person that starts that two-person company is, and then eventually if they're going public and it's a thousand-person company, 
it's a very different person. It has, that person has to evolve mm-hmm. a lot. They have to lead a lot of people. They have to learn functions. They have to manage people in functions, which they knew nothing about the day they were starting. So they have to learn almost more than any other, in any other profession that anyone learns over a course of a few years. So they have to be just amazing learners across, not just in terms of actual domain expertise, but also a lot of people skills, business judgment, reading markets, working with customers, all those kind of things. So we are trying to see if we can pick some clues on that front. And of course, resilience and ability to take no for an answer. They're going to knock on a lot of customers' doors. They're going to pitch a lot of investors. They're trying, going to try and hire a lot of folks. And a lot of folks are going to say no. So can they keep just going through that and make it all work in the end? And yeah, I can keep going. We can talk for an hour about <laughs> what we what makes a great founder. But I'd say a lot of different things there on the founder. Sure. Uh, I was wondering, could you give us an example just to help us wrap our minds around this process of uh, looking at uh, a potential investment and, and uh, kind of scaling it? Uh, could you give us uh, an example of a startup we worked with that demonstrated remarkable early growth uh, and kind of give us at least the broad uh, brush strokes, if you will, of what strategies contributed to their success. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few high growth startups. Let me pick one. It's a company that helps, that uses AI to create corporate presentations Mm -hmm. for large employees. And I'm sure all of us have been in a lot of knowledge workers. We all make a lot of PowerPoint and other slide decks. And there's a lot of work that goes into just structuring it. And there's also many right ways to do it, many wrong ways to do it. So there's a lot of science to it. There's a lot of art as well. So this company present, they, they've they really trained the AI on millions of uh, slide decks to really figure out for many different kinds of decks of what really should go into a deck. And then it adapts that to the audience and to the context and to the company and some of those things. So this is a company we invested in a couple of years back, very high caliber founder, demonstrates a lot of those characteristics that I was mentioning earlier. And in this case, the market we thought was really large. So if the company gets it right, almost every knowledge worker could be a potential user of such Mm -hmm. such a product. And initially the company starts with enterprises. So even just within enterprises, there is tens of millions of knowledge workers just in the US and then globally even more. Very large market. And the product was very differentiated at the time, two or three years back. And the company had access to a specific data set, which not many have access to, or very, I'd say almost no one has access to that sort of data set amongst the companies that are trying something like this to be able to train that AI on actual presentations and then know what has worked, what is not. So yeah, I'd say those are some of the high level things. And yeah, the company has been on a great growth trajectory since then, and they have several dozen large enterprise customers, including many name brands and hundreds of thousands of people within each of them and within many of them, which are using this product. And then I'd say still early days, this company we think can be on that trajectory, like as describing what we look for, something that can be a category defining large outcome if things go right. A lot of things still have to mm-hmm. go right, but it's demonstrating a lot of those characteristics. So in the journey to date, what would you say has been the biggest factor in their growth? Yeah, I'd say it's having the right product in really solving a very pronounced pain point that folks have, that a lot of knowledge Mm -hmm. workers are spending these hours creating these presentations where you want to be actually focused on the message you want to communicate and what you're trying to get from it, not on moving around boxes and wordsmithing little things you want. If a machine can do some of that and really give you the most impactful headlines, but then you are, so uh, I think it's solving that pronounced pain point. And then of course, it's been great execution from the company so far on really productizing the offering and the go-to-market piece, building out some of the demand gen channels, really going after making sure customers are aware of the product and then running some of those funnels really well. That's it. That's something we see across a lot of companies that do well. I think all of those things have to be true. I think pronounced pain point product that is easy to use, offers a great ROI, which is evident to the user or customer. And then that has to be really coupled by a great sales and marketing execution then. Would you say that the ROI needs to be 
easy for the, for potential customers to get their mind around almost immediately when they start using the product or other instances what you've seen have been successful where it takes a while to understand the, the product and all its abilities before the ROI kind of piece comes into play. Yeah, I'd say for enterprise type of products, enterprise or mid-market products where it's a sort of larger mm-hmm. sale than an individual sale, I think that persona that's buying the product, they have to have a sense of ROI fairly quickly. Mm-hmm even before they start using the product. And I'd say in most cases, they would have that sense because if they have that pain point, they know sure. that, hey, I have this team that's spending so much time on this and it's taking me so long to do that so I could do this faster if I had a product that did this. So I'd say that's where it really hits uh, best is where the pain point is so real for them that as soon as you tell them that, hey, this is what my product does, they may not know that, hey, ROI is five times or 10 times, but they have a sense that, hey, there is definitely going to be a meaningful ROI. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the company can then, the sales team and others can help them work through the specific, and it'll be very subjective of uh, how you'd calculate the ROI. But I'd say it has to hit them pretty quickly. I'd say even in the outreach that that companies do, we I'm a big fan of uh, including that. If companies already have a sense of what ROI they can drive, mm-hmm. including some of those examples, even as early as your outreach when you're first exposing the customer to what you do, whether it's a you know, cold email or an introduction or some marketing content, including that ROI and uh, making that really tangible really helps because the word is really noisy right yeah. now with lots of SaaS products. So for someone to even take that next step of thinking about your product and maybe taking a demo meeting or something, that becomes pretty important for enterprise and team type sales. I'd say for individual, when you're selling to an individual, it could be a little bit different. Individuals may not think of ROI in as quantitative of terms, but they often do in many cases. And in other cases, they're thinking of some other allied pieces, which then map into ROI. But right. then they're thinking about convenience or time saving, or they're just frustrated about something they're having to do repeatedly. Mm-hmm. And they just don't want to do that anymore. So there, it's a little bit different. Sure. Uh, I'm just thinking back to our earlier conversation and you're of the opinion that uh, founders should really spearhead the first million million or two in sales. Uh, I was wondering, could you elaborate on that and why it is so crucial, especially in the enterprise sales? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a big believer in that. And often folks can fall into the pitfall that, hey, I'm a great product or Mm -hmm. tech person and I'll raise funding, I'll go hire a salesperson or a sales head and they will go and sell it for me. The thing is, product and sales and marketing are not as, they're not decoupled at all. They're all tied very closely in the early days. And whatever you thought was the initial product and pitch, it really is the same even a month later or two months later. It's all iterating very fast. So I think having the same person actually be, and that person usually in most cases is the founder, but having that person who has that view across product, sales, marketing, customer success, and everything else, that becomes really key because you're taking that feedback from customers. So you're pitching customers and you hear things from them and there's many things you hear from them and you have to be able to process that. And that would often inform your product strategy it could inform your how you're doing customer success. It could inform how you're doing marketing, messaging, positioning, pricing. A lot of those things are very malleable. Mm-hmm. So till you have that early level of repeatability, it has to be the same person and ideally the person who has all the influence and power in the company. So then that person is the founder or one of the founders. That person has to do it. And, and also I think the early, an additional reason is that the first five, seven enterprise customers have to be almost just imagine if you're in a large enterprise, there's a lot at stake. You really don't want to make a big mistake doing something. You don't want to buying from startups is a high bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not an easy decision to buy from a startup. And so it really takes that passion from a founder to really get people over that hump. So you're really going uphill for the first three to five customers because they are really going against the grain and buying something from a startup that no one has ever heard of, which has no proof points, may not have any case studies in the early days. No one is using this product, but now this enterprise has to go use it. So I'd say it takes everything, including the passion of the founder, the depth of product knowledge that the founder may have and everything else to get it over the hump. So I'd say that's an additional reason 
why and we've seen this over and over so you put the best sales people out there and many times it just doesn't work uh, if the if it's uh, so early days so someone who may be great for a stage where there's a already a playbook there's territories there is a specific messaging there is specific icp everything is defined and people will go and hit million 2 million 3 million quotas and beat them and they'll let's start performer and you go put them in a startup which has only one or two customers and it just changes dramatically so yeah i'd say one of the most important learnings that we see over and over is that the first 5 to 10 customers in enterprise and mid market i think the founder really has to or one of the founders has to really make that sale mm. Uh, so uh, do you do you find though that uh, there is a bit of a uh, a mind shift required for them to come to terms with that way of thinking and uh, if so how do you help them uh, make that transition Yeah I think most founders these days know this uh, or many know this but I think uh, just getting up to speed with the sales mm-hmm. process and learning a lot of the ropes of the sales process uh that's the that's a journey that many founders go through i'd say many founders come from let's say they may come from a tech or product background predominantly so many of them may not have a prior sales background some of them do which then they are you know that's great but many of them don't and so i'd say the greatest founders are amazing learners it goes back to what i was saying about being great learners and we've seen founders within a month or two become really good at sales and or at least from where they were starting they are really far ahead within a couple of months and then within 6 months they are selling as good as a, a great sales person so yeah we work pretty closely with them on really being a helpful resource on any small or big decision they're doing in some cases we're discussing deal by deal going through some some of the initial pipeline deals of hey, this is what the customer said and this is what now they refer me to this and we're helping them qualify customers really encouraging them to actively expand the pipeline and qualify more aggressively So there's a lot of pitfalls that always happen. One natural one is folks will start talking to five people that they know and they uh, just implicitly assume they get some interest and they assume hey we're going to get five customers in 3 months. But then funnels are always <laughs> once you start doing sales you realize that hey there's no funnel with at least 200% or even 50% closure rate from even a high interest level uh, you, you'll be you're doing well if you're getting 15 20% maybe generally you'll get 10%. So you really have to build that wide funnel. and qualify aggressively so we do a lot of this always folks running things by us on some of those kind of things and then as they start thinking about and then often associated with that is often refining the icp expanding the icp what kind of customers geographies size of customer persona mm-hmm. should they be selling to so we are iterating with them on that and helping them think through that if and again all of these things are to the extent it depends a lot on the founder as well some founders li- like to bounce more of these things some are already good at, at some of these and they don't so it's pretty it varies a lot by each company but those are that, that's just hopefully that gives you a sense of the kind of things we are engaged you mentioned a couple of times that you find that really stand out founders are exceptional learners and i'm curious so what indicators have you observed that would prove that Uh, a founder is a, is an exceptional data and is it really able to uh, not just absorb vast and and deferring uh, bits of information but to be able to apply it well yeah uh, good good question that's so we typically spend a few weeks uh, over multiple meetings mm-hmm. and often we are setting up meetings for founders that we are in discussions with folks from our network and connecting them with prospective customers or people who know about the space or prospective advisors and then for some founders you can start seeing even within that few week period that they are able to take some of that feedback and iterate on that quickly and next time you're doing a conversation 3 days later they've already evolved their pitch or evolved their right. they've taken the input from the previous meeting in some seven other cases actually we are we engage with companies pretty early on even before they're raising the financing round so we've been in touch with them for a few months and we've seen them evolve over that few month period and then again you can then see those different dots on the founder journey of how they've taken that feedback and sometimes they may have pivoted a couple of times already within 6 months and there's no i'd say we like it when founders can take market feedback and make quick changes in the direction that they're taking mm-hmm. and are able to iterate on that and then and then we also 
just in the process of getting to know them, we are also looking to learn about what they have done in the past. And often we talk to founders who have done something in the past, whether successful or moderately successful or not successful. And none of them is predictive. There's some predictability, but I'd say even if they did some startup and that didn't work too well, we generally try to get to understand what did they learn from it. And often you can pick some of the, read some of the tea leaves from there a little bit of uh, if they're really taking some of the right learnings and they're honest with themselves in, in general. But yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a spread out process mm-hmm. over a few weeks and we're trying to read some of these tea leaves, but I'd say it's not predictive by any stretch. But generally, yeah, we've done, uh, I think we've done well so far. And like I was mentioning, yeah, a lot of the founders we work with, we're fortunate that are great learners. So I think we have filtered for that that dimension right. generally. That I would imagine is quite a skill. One of the other areas, of course, is this idea of bringing on early hires to to the startup. Obviously, there's a, a different skill set required in, in being able to do that. I'm curious, uh, what is your level of involvement in uh, in assisting founders with that? And do, do you get involved to the point where you're actually helping interview, say, sales or marketing hires, or is it more of an advisory type role? Yeah, so we are pretty closely involved. And again, depends on the founder, but there are several companies where we have personally interviewed all the candidates for the first five hires. So there were five people in the funnel for each of those roles. We've done 25 interviews with them and then bounced off for feedback on, hey, here are the pros and cons. In some other cases, we do play just the advisory role as the founder feels that they have enough resources and background to do that. It varies, but yeah, in quite a few cases, especially I'd say in the very earliest hires, we do get to, we get, we can get fairly involved and also in many times in sourcing those hires and then interviewing and then in many cases closing those hires, convincing great people to also join and give those people the real pros and cons of the company in question. So yeah, we're pretty hands on. Would you say that there are particular characteristics that you're looking for with these early hires, if so, or or qualities, if so, what would they be? That varies a lot by, of course, by the role and even within the early stage of the company, if it's the very first hire versus the company already has 25 people and it's the 26th hire and that's head of sales versus principal engineer versus. So varies a lot. But if I had to pick some general, of course, there'll be a lot of all the well-known. If you want to obviously hire someone who has the right skill set and they've done that before and they are high performers, they're smart, all of those things, they're ethical, all of those things will be there. But it's a couple of things which... We often see founders, I'll mention, I'll call those ones out more, mm-hmm. is there's often a tendency to over-index on logos and prior domain expertise. Mm-hmm. So especially for first-time founders, they would say, hey, I'm in this space, so let me look at the top three companies in the space, and I'm going to hire people from those three companies because they have the domain expertise and they're going to be very bright and they know everything. Issue is some, that could work, but I've not found that very predictive of success in a startup right. world. So if you are a 100,000 employee company, the vectors of success are very different from what it takes in a startup. To start with, your your impact in a large company is very large, but then your specific role is extremely narrow and you're working with hundreds of other people and you're really trying to balance who's doing what and coordination and a lot of those things. In a startup, generally, most people would play some level of a generalist role within certain mm-hmm. bounds. Engineer may be in sometimes involved in the sales process, sometimes even customer success, sometimes in product management and many other areas. And similarly, a salesperson might also almost quasi be a product person because they are feeding in all the requirements and they may also be writing some marketing collateral and other things. So I like to suggest prioritizing sort of very smart generalists within their functions. So for go-to-market hires, smart GTM generalists, and ideally someone who's seen the journey that you're about to embark for the next two years. So if you are in that, for the first hire, I'd say ideally they have seen that very early journey where things are very ambiguous, things are really moving. They have to be really comfortable with that level of ambiguity. And if you are, let's say, early PMF and you're scaling, then you want to hire someone who's gone from that one to 10 or whatever your next couple of year target is. And, and then, yeah, it doesn't have to be in a big, low company. I'd say, in a, for example, if you're hiring for sales, someone who's hit a million dollar, dollar quota in a no-name company, I would take that person more seriously for a 
company that's just starting out or for the first sales hire than someone who was a star performer in the biggest brand in the segment. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? You know, it's the biggest brand in the segment. Everyone, the <laughs> processes are well-defined. Product is mature. Yeah. Brand is strong. There's a lot of references to customers. Of course, this person will be a great salesperson to be the top salesperson mm -hmm. there. But the skill set that they have may not really fit with the startup where the brand is not there. Product may not be very well-defined. It's not very polished. So you really have to hit a very different notes in that role. So that's one thing we see, I say, pretty frequently, with, especially with first-time founders. And that's where we uh, often come in and counsel that, hey, really look for that raw smarts and ability to pick up things, a lot of that learning ability, and then look for people who can be journalists across at least their few functions. If it's an engineer, maybe it's an engineer who has some sense of product, is good at working with customers to some extent. And similarly, if it's a salesperson, maybe they can do a little bit of marketing, a little bit of collateral, a little bit of customer success in the early days. And that's generally worked out slightly better for companies in my experience. Uh, definitely. And that makes a lot of sense. We, you also talked about honing in on customer feedback and research, especially early on. As companies scale and perhaps get funding, etc., cetera, do you find that there is a risk of losing that focus? Uh, and if so, how do you steer companies back to that piece? Yeah. Yeah, it's very important. I think the product market fit is always evolving. It's a continuous mm -hmm. process. And I think the best teams and best founders, they figure out a way to continuously look ahead 6, 12, 24 months and figuring out where the puck is moving and whether it is by continuously talking to customers personally at the CEO founder level or by collecting feedback from customers in a more structured manner through your customer success and through the NPS process. And also the best founders are also very alert in the market, really picking up tidbits from what's, what else is happening around the market, what else is around the corner, newer technologies, newer startups that are getting funded and what could be taking off. So I'd say it takes a lot of effort and I'd say that becomes, I'd say, a very important part of the CEO's role after they've hired their first management team. So if they have leaders, let's say, in sales, marketing, customer success, product, finance, HR. That is one of the most important roles is in addition to, of course, they're hiring and there's some level of operations, fired, all those things. But one of the most important strategic roles is looking around the corners and looking 6, 12, 24 months out and keeping very strong tabs on the market through some of the things that I mentioned. And uh, obviously the big question everyone's uh, uh, thinking about is when it comes to fundraising, what are some of the not so obvious pitfalls that you've had to advise people to avoid or to get around? Lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I've written about some of them. And yeah, from being on the other side, you get to see, and, and we see it actually from both sides. So there are obviously thousands of startups that pitch our firm. So we see all those pitches. But then also once we partner with founders, they are then raising their next rounds. And then we see some of the, we're closely involved in that process. So we see the, how the market reacts to that. One thing actually that I've written about is, uh, is sales and raising venture capital could look similar on at least on the top level. And founders have often, let's say they've built some muscle on the sales side. They've learned now how to sell their first five customers and they've gotten the beat of that. So now they think that, hey, venture fundraising is like sales. Mm -hmm. So they start to run the venture funding process like a sales process. So there's some similarities, but there's actually a lot of differences and those have to be really kept in mind. So for a successful venture capital process, you really have to run a process which has a timeline and on which you have multiple in large enough funnel running at the same cadence. Because one major difference is when sales your customer doesn't really, if you sell, a customer A doesn't care that customer B, C, and D are also buying a product at the same time. If anything, they actually like, they, that process benefits. Customer A maybe is more likely to buy if customer B, C, and D are buying. But in a venture round, that's, that's just finite. You're raising whatever you're raising. Let's say you're raising 3 million seed round or a 15 million series A. Once one venture firm invests, <laughs> there isn't another lead investor mm -hmm. that can usually invest. So... You have to create that dynamic of, and you have to really understand and run your process accordingly. So putting a timeline, having multiple firms running at the same cadence, and I'd say figuring out how much to raise, that is a really important piece. And if you, 
if, uh, we often see founders who overshoot where they are at. And if you go out to the market trying to raise more than where the company currently would merit, that can lead to very unfavorable outcomes because it's hard to then go down and say, okay, look, now I'm actually raising less. Mm -hmm. So you went out with trying to raise 15 million and now you come back, you get feedback from the market and people won't tell you that it's too much. They'll just say that maybe they'll not take meetings or they'll just pass and they'll politely mention something. But then maybe the company was only worth the amount where they could have raised seven, eight million dollars or something like that and not 15. So really figuring out w uh, what that range is that you want to go out with. That's something we see over and over. And we work again closely with the founders we are partnered with on figuring out for the next rounds on how much should they be raising and what should who should be the folks yeah. that should be engaging with, what should be the timing and cadence. And then talking of timing, <laughs> that's another fourth one maybe, is venture fundraising takes the seasonality throughout the year for better or for worse but that's how it is you know summer and winter are really bad times to start a fundraise so right. any time of you know from may through august and then november and december are times that you do not want to start fundraising so you want to actually close your fundraising before uh, you know any of these periods so you want to idly start in either september october or in january or february to participate in these two sort of distinct cycles and again, often there's a lot of things going on and founders often want to hit, hey, let me get to this milestone or do this and do that. And then I'll go out and then they go out on a, like uh, in June or November or something. And what happens is, yeah, it just doesn't fit some of the market cycle. Of course, there's exceptions, best companies mm -hmm. raise in any market, but uh, you want to optimize your likelihood of a successful outcome. And for that, you have to recognize the seasonality that the market has and work with that. Right. Uh so those are a few other ones. So there's quite a few more. <laughs> I, would, I would imagine so. Would you say, though, that perhaps the, the times that we're living in have also introduced a new dynamic that, that founders need to take uh, into account, given that perhaps capital isn't so readily available as it used to be? The market has changed quite a bit, of course, to say the least, over the last 12 to 18 months. And yes, absolutely. I, I'd say... Interestingly, we, of course, all lived through the last, I'd say, between 2020 and 21, maybe early part of 22. Uh, I see that as more of an exception mm -hmm. where capital became really freely flowing at all stages. And I think the bar was just very different for raising these large rounds or any rounds. I think where we are at for great companies, at least at Seed and Series A, is closer to a more normalized market mm -hmm. and maybe the same level of difficulty as it was in the maybe eight or 10 years before 2020. So I'd say, yeah, capital raising, raising these larger rounds shouldn't be easy. I, I think it should be, there should be a bar for it. Of course, I think there shouldn't be unnecessary friction in the process, but there's only a certain number of companies can really justify doing that. So yeah, but I think the best founders are navigating it. I think it's a good time to take stock of where the company is at and do, does it want to be on the path where it wants to keep raising money? Mm -hmm. In that case, you have to demonstrate both growth and high amount of capital efficiency, so efficient growth. Or if not, then you have to get to a path uh, that's cash flow positive or close to it and more self-sustaining and grow with internal accruals. Mm -hmm. That's how a lot of SaaS was always built in the early days, historically outside of the last five years. A lot of SaaS was built like that and it can be done. A lot of founders that that call that, hey, let's raise smaller amounts of money now with seed and then let's just figure out at each milestone, hey, let's just get to close to cash flow positive. That keeps us master of our de own destiny. Mm. If someone comes and gives us a large check, then we take it at our terms or we don't have to. And I think that's a great way to build a business. Mm. There's obviously a need for growth uh, and scaling, but uh, how do you suggest we balance uh, that need along with the importance of maintaining uh, the core values and the overall mission uh, or purpose of, of what we're trying to achieve uh, during the journey? I'd say the, often the two can be aligned. The mission often is to solve a certain problem at scale. And let's say you recognize a certain problem that, hey, people are with this persona across all kinds of companies across the world have this problem. Often the mission for some of these venture funded companies, especially founders have this mission to really solve that problem for a wide set of those people. And uh, so the two can be pretty aligned that your mission is to actually solve that problem for a large number of companies. And to get there, you have to grow at a high rate. Uh, 
and of course you have to do that in a if the you have to stick to your values and do the right thing and, and, mm-hmm. and of course be uh, a good stewards of capital in terms of uh, especially in the current market being very efficient with each dollar of how it's being spent in terms of so yeah i'd say it's yeah it's a lot of balance uh, would you suggest that companies codify their culture and use it regularly in internal meetings and uh, just to keep everyone focused on the overall direction in which we are headed as opposed to just a pure focus on numbers and quarters and things of that nature absolutely yeah yeah i i'd say once companies get to a certain stage once they have more than a few individuals often you have to start getting more systematic about codifying and very methodical and deliberate about what culture you want to create in the organization and making sure everyone is aligned because you're going to soon before you know it there's a lot of new people joining yep. so i'd say in the first few hires they're very close to the founders founders are themselves hiring the first few folks so at that point you're probably okay with not spending a lot of time on codifying these things but as soon as you get to a point where there's a number of people coming in and the people that you you haven't personally hired and now everyone needs to be aligned and working together mm-hmm. so at that point I'd say it makes a lot of sense to start codifying it at different levels i think in the early days it's it can be as basic as just getting everyone together and brainstorming and writing that here are the three or four things that are really critical to us here's the mission statement here's the overall vision and here's how we're going to operate and it doesn't have to be super elaborate in the early days it's good to keep it really simple easy to understand so that it gets communicated propagated mm-hmm. understood across the team and then of course as you grow larger and you have folks in managing specifically hr and people ops and other things then that those areas and processes get more built out but certainly i, I say yes yeah, it's super important otherwise we just have a you don't have a team you just have a group of individuals mm. doing their thing yep makes sense i'm sure there's a lot more we could uh, dive into but uh, i'm curious given the space that you're operating uh, are there perhaps a couple of areas that you find doesn't get much airtime if so what would they be that's a good question i think we've touched upon a few on this uh, uh, on this discussion i think we since it's what predictable b2b growth i'd say often at the growth stages we've seen this happen with a lot of companies like we were alluding to a little bit earlier but really keeping that sales marketing product in cadence while you have expanded the team and there's a lot of different people that need to work together uh often find that takes a lot of deliberate effort and many companies miss that in the first instance and then they go back and correct it and they often can lose sort of a couple of or few quarters of potential growth in that process uh so yeah being aware of that and being deliberate about that uh, you know early on uh that is something that you know again we work with founders on that but often it's just it's not instinctive because what gets you from 0 to 1 and then you're going from 1 to n it just changes very dramatically and people are just busy doing a lot of other things they're hiring so many people and they're setting processes and some of those things but that can often yeah be overlooked in that process so that's yeah one that comes to mind okay brilliant and um just to wrap up if you were listening to this episode what would you say would be your top takeaway i'd say it's really about a lot of things in that startup 0 to 1 and the early part of 1 to n is just very high level of iteration and really combining art and science in taking those steps so i'd say for founders it's really surround yourselves with the right small set of advisors and investors who you can lean on as you make those decisions that will really compound into something big hopefully because being those decisions right the first time that can be the difference between having momentum versus not so i'd say that's uh, yeah if i just summarize it's a yeah lots of iteration lots of small decisions that add up to that one big outcome that are not visible usually from the outside or even at a high level but then when you dig in it's like a sum of a lot of small things so yeah make sure you're making those decisions carefully and surround yourself with the right folks excellent and if listeners are curious want to find out more or connect with you where would you recommend they head to yeah i'm on linkedin i'm on twitter i'm pretty easy to find on email it's my first name at emergent.vc and yeah 
pretty easy to find me. Okay, we'll include links to that in the show notes. And Bob, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here.